with the latest from Dave Weinberg from the Press of Atlantic City. Covers the birds, of course, longtime Eagles beat writer. And Dave, it looks like we got some news on Alshon Jeffrey being cleared for contact. His status for Sunday is still up in the air. Uh, but does clear for contact tell you that they're going to have their main target uh, back at wide receiver? Yeah, if I were to guess, I'd say yes. I mean, they, they're probably going to ease him back into action a little bit. I don't know how many reps he'll get. But um, when you have somebody with that much talent and that much ability that, as Alshon, he, he adds another dimension to that offense. And the sooner they can get him back in there, the better off he'll be. Obviously, yeah, they've been lacking that. I mean, they only had seven targets to wide receivers last week. That was kind of game-planned, but getting him back should really open some things up and give them a dimension that they've been really lacking. Yeah, they've been uh, – well, last Sunday, of course, they focused on their tight ends quite a bit and uh, the running game, of course, which I'm sure they'll consider – they'll continue to have a balanced offense. But, um, yeah, Alshon gives them that, that, that uh, deep threat and even uh, the red zone – uh, target that they that they've been lacking on a consistent basis so far. So yeah, it's, um, to have him back, I think that brings a, a big spark to the offense. What does the uh, configuration kind of look like in your mind when Alshon comes back? What do they do uh, with Jordan Matthews' role and Nelson Aguilar's role? How do you think those two guys end up, uh, you know, uh, being impacted by the return of Alshon? Yeah, that's going to be an interesting uh, dilemma for them. Um, I don't know if they. Uh, keep Aguilar outside and put Jordan in the slot or they flip-flop them or uh, Jordan gets a reduced role and maybe they use Shelton Gibson a little more, which they didn't use at all uh, on Sunday. So um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how they figured out. They had Josh Perkins spread out wide uh, a lot with uh, with Dallas and um, and Zach, of course. So, yeah, it's going to uh, – I'm curious to see how Doug kind of figures out, you know, how to use his weapons here. Uh, Dave Weinberg from the Press of Atlantic City is with us. Eagles getting ready to take on the Tennessee Titans. Uh, we know that uh, Ajay and Sproles feeling better might be ready to go, but it seemed that the Eagles did a good job of filling in without those guys with Clement and Wendell Smallwood. So when they get all four guys back healthy, how does that play out? Well, uh, uh, of course, uh, Jay Ajay is the workhorse, I guess, and you know Darren will be used as he always is in third down situations and stuff. Plus, um, Corey has already proven that he deserves a, a you know a pretty sizable role, which means I guess reduced playing time for Wendell and probably no playing time for the other guy for uh, for Josh Adams. That, that, that's the way I would think of it happen. Yeah, and uh, Adams had what six carries or so. I mean, he was limited in. Uh... Uh, in the game plan, but he did look pretty good in the limited role that he provided for the Eagles. And uh, we know that Jay is kind of the guy, but Corey got 16 carries, but it was really Wendell Smallwood who kind of uh, had, was the bright spot, I thought, on Sunday. I thought he really had the best day of the running backs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's always been the case with Wendell. When he's healthy, um, he's as good as anyone. It's just the fact that he's been battling injuries for the last two years that kept him from realizing his potential. But, um, uh, he's he be the first one to tell you that, you know, it's all about making the most of your opportunities. And when he got the chance on Sunday, he, he certainly capitalized on it. Dave, uh, they also have uh, some other injury issues at possibly safety with Rodney McLeod. He left the game. He did not return. Uh, another guy that uh, Doug said he'll learn more in the week. But that's one spot where, you know, they were thin at in uh, coming into this season. They brought Corey Graham in, and he's obviously a nice veteran to have out there. But if Rodney can't go – uh, that's a spot that you might take a look at and, and wonder uh, how they would fill that spot. Yeah, that's true. If, if I were to guess, I would say Corey Graham would be the guy that would start in that place because, you know, Chris Margaris, of course, isn't ready to play yet. So, yeah, they're really thin at safety. So, uh, if I were to guess, I, I would think he would be the guy that they, they put out there. But that's a big loss, though. Rodney's a pretty yeah. big part of their defense. Uh, and then I know uh, Doug was asked today about one of the corners or some of the corners making the move. I mean, they have so many talented corners that just to try to get them out in the field. Would he consider uh, Rasul Douglas or one of the other corners maybe getting some safety time? If you were going to do that, I would think Rasul would be the guy because he's a big, uh, bigger physical kind of guy. I don't think Jalen is ready to play safety, um, and they really like him on the outside. So I I'm going to guess that uh, – Russell would probably be the guy, but like you like you said, they have a, they have a lot of corners there, and it's a nice problem to have. They have a lot of depth and a lot of a lot of talent at that position. So you know, the more they can get guys on the field, the better off they'll be. Dave, uh, I know 
Carson coming back was a big story. And then obviously, you know, he, he was off here and there. I think it was more of a timing issue than anything because he certainly – uh, was able to move around, and, and were you surprised at how much he was able to do right off the bat? Yeah, I was. I was. I didn't know that. I don't know like exactly how healthy he was, but um, more so than than anything, just the fact that he was able to avoid pass rushers. Um, well, he did get sacked five times, but just his scramble scrambling ability could have been uh, more. His ability to take a hit, his willingness to take a hit. Um, it seemed like that in that regard, at least, uh, the old Carson was back. You know, he was uh, his old, his usual aggressive uh, self, and that, and that was really good to see. Dave, uh, as far as what we're going to expect from an offensive side of the ball, we saw a lot of one running back, three tight ends, and then we saw him come out right out the gates with no huddle, Chip Kelly style, fast pace offense. This Titans team likes to make things ugly, slow it down, stop the run, and and beat you in an ugly battle. What's the game plan for Doug Peterson going into this game? Does he spread it out? Does he go more one running back, three tight end? What do you expect to see from the offense? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I'm going to say they're probably going to try and go up tempo, uh, at least at the outset. Both the, That seems to be kind of Carson's comfort level. And uh, as, as you mentioned, I think that will probably yeah, put the Titans off, Titans off balance a little bit. Um, and like you said, they like to ground it, grind it out. They like to slow things down. So if the Eagles can – can change the tempo of the game, and uh, I would think they try to spread it out a little bit more, uh, maybe take some shots down the field, especially if Alshon's able to play. And, uh, you know, if they can get a lead, that'll force the, the Titans out of their comfort zone. What were your thoughts on uh, Dallas Goddard's big game? Is kind of welcome to the game there. After the first two games, a lot of fans and people following the team were kind of, I guess, clamoring Dallas Goddard. We need him in there, especially with the injuries that the team's dealing with. So talk about what you saw from him this past week against the Colts and his role this week and moving forward. Yeah, that was good to see because, uh, like everybody else, I was kind of questioning, you know, exactly if he was ready to play at this level or uh, capable of it. But, um, you know, he had one catch for four yards in the first two games combined. But uh, Doug really found a way to, to utilize him yesterday was, or Sunday. Uh, got his first career touchdown, which uh, I think was, was great to see. It was great for his confidence. And I think the more he plays and the more confidence he gets, um, I think that his bigger, the bigger uh, role he'll have, and um, I would see him uh, this Sunday. I would think I'm having, I would see him having probably a similar role as he had, a similar role as he had last week. Uh, I know Mike was asking about the running backs and Corey Clement. Do you expect Corey Clement? Because I think he's capable of a bigger role. I know Doug likes to do the running back by committee, throw different guys in there. But if and when a giant Sproles comes back. What is Corey Clement's role here moving forward the rest of the year? I'm guessing it's probably going to be a reduced role. Unfortunately, like you said, he's certainly proven that he deserves a you know a bigger role. I, if I were them, I would probably div divvy up the carries between Ajay and Corey, and maybe use roles a little bit less. Um, he's older. Uh, you want to guard against injury. You know, he's already had one that that's kept him out for a game or two games. So you want to uh, preserve him as much as you can. Plus, you need Darren to be your punt returner because Corey can't handle that. He proved that on Sunday. So, uh, if I'm them, I, I think I, I use Jay and Corey, and, and uh, I give Corey a little bit more of an expanded role. And, uh, like I said, divvy up the carries between the two of them. And even use him as a, as a receiver, too, because he's certainly capable of catching the ball. Yeah, and I know, uh, you know, when this offense gets back to full strength, it should be interesting to see how they work it because I doubt – at full strength, this is going to be a team that uses a lot of 13 personnel, or do you think that they might stick with that? No, I think they'll, they'll, uh, they'll probably uh, shy away from that a little bit more and uh, probably have a more of a balanced game, maybe take some more shots down the field and 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 uh, have less of a tight end presence. Just a little bit less of a tight end presence, I think. Yeah, um, and that'll be interesting to see what they do there because Ertz and Goddard had their yeah, best right. games, and how do they kind of split that up? And, you know, he was asked today about getting kind of the band back together that they're going to get Jay and Sproles and Alshon, and, and, you know, will that take some time to kind of fit together? And he kind of admitted that, you know, it, it might be a little clunky at first. Yeah, even Carson talked about that today too, that he's, you know, he's hoping to click with Alshon as soon as possible, though it might take a little bit of time. One of the one of the advantages, though, is though that when they were both injured during training camp, they spent a lot of time together working on things. You know, 
Carson would be throwing through a lot of passes to Alshon, both when they were off the side and after after practices. So I don't know that the transition will take as long as, as what people think. Um, they're going to face a, a, a Titans team, Dave, that uh, won 9-6 on the road in Jacksonville last week. So they don't have any problem making it an ugly game. And I guess, you know, the Eagles got a little practice with that this week. But is another game like that a benefit to the Eagles, or do you think that is a benefit to Tennessee? Oh, it definitely benefits Tennessee, um, especially with Mariota. He's not all the way back from the, from the elbow injury that he suffered a couple weeks ago. That really affects his uh, ability to grip the football and to throw it. So, yeah, the more that they, they can rely on their defense and slow the game down, the better off it's going to be. And I would think – I mean, the Eagles are certainly capable of handling that kind of game, but I would think that they want to open up and maybe put some more points on the board. Yeah, and we know uh, the Titans are a 3-4 defense, which uh, in the past the Andy Reid teams typically had uh, some issues with. And he kind of discussed how that kind of – changes the dynamics of, of facing them this week in the, those 34 defenses. Yeah, and don't forget the the, the uh, middle of that defense is a local kid, Austin Johnson from uh, St. Augustine Prep and uh, Galloway Township. He's their starting nose tackle. And I, actually, I talked to Coach Rabel about him today, and um, he's really impressed with the progress that, that Austin has shown. Um, he had a big third down stop against Jacksonville last week. They kind of turned the game in their favor. So uh, that'll be something for the local fans to keep an eye on. Yeah, uh, as you uh, alluded to there, they're 3-4. He's the nose. Jarrell uh, Casey is the uh, defensive end. He's got uh, three sacks on the year. So they've got some very uh, – this is a team that made the playoffs last year. I think they, they've had some issues at quarterback. That's been their problem. Uh, they can't get one quarterback to stay on the field. Mariota's been hurt. Gabbert's been banged up. Uh, but they've got a pretty – this is a – this is a kind of I don't like Ryan mentioned a trap game, but this is one of those teams that made the playoffs. But a lot of people don't look at them as a playoff team, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like they're just not sexy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. I definitely agree. Yep. Yep. The AFC, the AFC South is kind of like that. Even Jacksonville, as good as they are on defense and stuff, they they kind of uh, snuck up on people, I guess, last year a little bit. Um, but yeah, that, that entire division is filled with the same kind of caliber teams. Uh, defensive-oriented guys or diff- defensive-oriented teams that try to slow the game down, rely on their running game as much as they can on offense. So, yeah, yeah, I can see where you would think that. What was uh, – you were uh, there Sunday. What was the reaction for Wentz uh, when he was introduced? Oh, gosh, it was uh, it was amazing, yeah, how much the fans – and I, I, to be honest with you, I, just, I felt a little bad for Nick Foles. Um, because uh, I know that I mean he did so much for the team and for the for the city, you know, last year for him to to take the back seat like that. I know he didn't mind it, but it probably had to grade on him a little bit. But yeah, the fans are uh, they're all in with Carson. I mean, they they really miss him, and uh, you know the ovation he got when he came out of the tunnel that that was, that was really special. Uh, Dave Weinberg from the Press of Atlantic City covers the Eagles, and of course the Eagles will take on the Titans uh, this. Sunday down in Nashville, and they've won 11 out of 13 games down there. So, tricky game for the Philadelphia Eagles. If, if I'm asking you, what style of play would you dial up to go after this Titans team? I would spread the ball out, and I would go deep right away. Uh, I would try to put some points on the board, like I said earlier, to, to maybe you know put them back on their heels a little bit, uh, take the crowd out of the game if they can and uh, then go from there. Maybe I would try to force the, tit- the, the Titans to have to play catch up here. Yeah, I think uh, we both uh, kind of agree with that. Dave, uh, I do want to touch on uh, your column this week in the press of Atlantic City. Uh, you talk about the uh, Rutgers situation going on up there. They get blown out by Kansas and then follow up with a 42-13 to loss against Buffalo. And now uh, you had mentioned in the beginning of that press article – uh, that Chris Ash told you during media day that he wants to build the program highly competitive that we can be proud of and that people will be excited to watch every single Saturday. You said that hasn't happened, not even close. So here we are again early. Now, this is a program that has had a lot of issues, uh, but do you think this is maybe a low point for them? Uh, no, they've had a few low points <laughs> uh, in their in their lives, but yet to lose at home to Buffalo, um, that's got to be rock bottom. I mean, nothing against Buffalo. They're four and zero, and they have a, they have some NFL players on that roster. But uh, the fact that they have more talent than Rutgers uh, should tell you everything you need to know. And I don't know if it's um, 
I don't know if it's Chris Ash's fault or not, but uh, uh, I would think that the blame ultimately falls on him. I mean, he's the guy that does the recruiting. He's the guy that develops everything. So the fact that he hasn't been able to to mold a program, I'm not, I'm not, nobody's expecting him to win the Big Ten or to even be competitive in that, and you know, against the Ohio States and the Michigans and stuff. But you, you can't lose the Kansas and you can't lose the Buffalo. I mean, those are the teams that you have to beat in order to – to just be able to at least become respectable. And I think that's all their fans really want. They just want something that's worth watching. They want a reason to be able to go down, to, go up to Piscataway and, you know, and spend three hours on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, they're just not getting that right now. You mentioned in the article. I don't know if they ever pull to be out. Yeah, and you mentioned in the article that Rutgers paid Buffalo $900,000 to play that game. Um, so that's a steep price to pay to get your butt whipped. You mentioned the crowd, 34,500, but uh, many witnesses said that the place was half empty and it's a 52,000-seat stadium. I was on the uh, uh, talking with somebody earlier. I said, I've been up there many times on a Saturday night at 8 o'clock when you're playing a game and the place is half empty. So it seems that not a lot of people uh, are – there's not a lot of support. Is that part of the problem? Yeah, I mean, this is a this has been a, an issue that's been going on for a long, long time, and um, I hate to admit it, but New Jersey or even, like New Jersey itself, especially Rutgers, this is this is not a college football state. I mean, you're not going to get a hundred thousand people like you know like you do in in the South and then and then uh, even out on the West Coast, you know, where um, it's just people would just rather watch the Eagles and the Giants yeah. and the Jets. They just don't care about Rutgers all that much. I mean, they have their core fan base that are that are pretty loyal, but it's just uh, college football just doesn't seem to be you know, that important to people in New Jersey. I don't know if it ever will be, to be honest. No, and that's been a big thing is that you go to a lot of these other states. My question had been, you know, they did have a little success uh, with Shiano, and everybody always points back yep. to that. And, oh, they were good oh. under Shiano. Well, that's been, you know, mm-hmm. almost – 10 years, Ten years since that, and that's really the only microcosm of success that they really had. How much did people care then? Yeah, well, I guess I think to Gray's credit, he was a very uh, boisterous, very um, uh, fan-friendly, I guess, if you will. He did a really good job of recruiting talent, of getting players, not only the, to, the, not only getting New Jersey players to stay in state, which has been a problem for a long time. but also Number one, number one on the – that's the number one. Would you agree? What's that? What's that? That's the number one issue that they've had. They can't get it. Oh, yeah, they yeah. can't I mean, get New the players Jersey to stay. has as much high school talent as anybody in the country. But, yeah, when you look at New Michigan's roster, you look at Ohio State. I mean, Malcolm Jenkins grew up in Piscataway and went to Ohio State. Right. That's to tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was having a conversation with uh, with the Rutgers guy this morning at, talking about, like, I went to West Virginia. There's no talent in West Virginia. <laughs> At all. They're not getting any guys in state there. They went outside, and that's what Shiana was able to do. He went to Florida. But it seems that Rutgers is content on taking the fifth or sixth guy in New Jersey as opposed to the maybe second or third guy in Florida, where that's what West Virginia has kind of been able to Places like West Virginia, not there that they're the only one. Places that don't have in-state talent. Right, right. And they're, uh, they're getting the five-star recruits, whereas Rutgers is getting the three-star guys. I mean, that's also against them. It's, I mean, they've had their share of NFL players in the league. You know, sure. Guys like Kenny Brick and there. But they, from, like, top to bottom, they just don't have uh, the overall uh, talent that the other, and talent and depth that the other schools have. Uh, it's a good article. Check it out, pressofatlanticcity.com. Okay. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, as you said, I went to a college football school. It's disappointing that uh, th- that this is not really – a state that supports college football. I'm not sure that it ever will, whether they're good, bad, no. and different. You know, I don't, I, I don't know that it, it, it would take uh, multiple seasons in a row of uh, of high level play. I think to start to build something in terms of a fan yeah, base I, that would care. Yep, yeah, I definitely agree. Right, I mean, because there's a lot of states where they say, "Well, it's a far drive, an hour and a half drive to go see a great football team is not a big deal in places that care." Oh, no. I mean, 10 states, like one road in, one road out. And yeah. guys, people leave at like 5 a.m. to get there to, to watch games. But it's worth it to them. And that's where, you know, I don't know if Rutgers will ever be at that level, but they should be able to 
at least draw 35, 40,000 people to a game. You would hope. You would hope. There's a lot of uh, people that live up in that area. Uh, you can check out the full article, pressofatlanticcity.com, and follow Dave on Twitter, at PressACWeinberg. And, of course, he joins us Wednesdays here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Thank you, Dave. Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it.